our time. So I will hand off the baton to the next group. Well, I'll just take over then, shall I, Hannah Vera? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a there was a mention of a bio break. Is that essential? Because uh, or should you just nip out if you need to? Just mute, mute the sound and the camera and so on. If you remember to mute your speakers, <laughs> then you can keep listening. <laughs> yeah, true. Right. Well, just sh give me a show of hands if we just should just continue because it's 11 or 12 here where we are or where you are. Or I don't know what time it is, actually. Um, Getting a lot of thumbs up and smiling faces. All right, you? excellent. Then, uh, Susan, where have you, where have you gone? I'm, I'm oh, here. Oh, there you are. <laughs> right. Okay, so I'll mute myself now and manage the PowerPoint. Please do. Okay, everyone, welcome to session four with the Nordic Network, this time from Sweden, where the presentations share a focus, as you can see, and what the teacher's semantic work and what this means for students' opportunities for both inclusion and appropriation of knowledge using semantic gravity. We will present analyzes from different educational contexts, starting with in primary school and ending at university level. Starting out, I, Suzanne, and my co colleague, Anna Maria, will present some initial analysis of semantic gravity in primary school history teaching. Our study has two over arcing aims, where the first is to explore how students encounter decontextualized, that is SG minus, and contextualized SG plus content in primary school history teaching. We also have a slightly minor aim, which is to examine how students realize decontextualized and contextualized history knowledge in a written exam. We'll come to that in the end. This study is part of a long-term project looking at professional development program at the compulsory school here in Gothenburg. The school is a multilingual school with 80, some 80% 80 of the students have an immigrant background and varying levels of L2, that is Swedish proficiency. Um, other parts of the project focuses are the school subjects and the actual professional development program. And this study can be seen as a pinpoint study of one segment trying out one of the potential applications of LCT in the project. Now, just to introduce you to the primary school history context, um, the Swedish curricula have to say that there are four main abilities that instruction should provide uh, for students. Uh, in compulsory school. So teaching in history should essentially give pupils the opportunities to develop their ability to use a historical frame of reference that incorporates different interpretations of time periods, events, notable figures, cultural meetings and development trends. It should also give them um, the chance to critically examine, interpret, and evaluate sources as a basis for creating historical knowledge. There are a few more aims, but I was, as you can see, we've concentrated on two here. You can also see that primary school history is, is much more than what happened in the past. Um, in other words, there are high linguistic demands on the students. So given the nature of these aims, we first decided to explore how students encounter decontextualized and contextualized content in primary school history teaching. Now, this is the tricky part. Here we come to the translation device that we based in the syllabus and other translation devices we worked. So we worked with this translation device that ended up having three levels. 
The two in blue um, at the upper section of the picture uh, deals with weaker semantic gravity because we needed to make more distinction between, for example, the particular work area that was studied and earlier work areas of history or historical commentaries. The red part corresponds to stronger as semantic gravity where we ended up with only one level containing everything that has to do with nowadays, both uh, as interpretations, examples, and practices. So starting from the top, the weakest semantic gravity in blue represents specific historical knowledge and concepts relating to the particular work area. The example here is from a film where the students are told that through his many conquests, he, that is the king, has led the foundation for Sweden's great empire and is one of Protestantism's strongest advocates in the war against Catholicism in Europe. At the next level, the blue in italics show that the semantic gravity is slightly stronger as it concerns more everyday examples of historical concepts. Um, it could also be context relating to previous work areas or commentary on life then. The example here is taken from the year six textbook and reads, and by controlling the ports of the Baltic Sea, Sweden and other countries could take customs duties on the goods and thus make a lot of money. And finally, the strongest semantic gravity in red are concepts of phenomena which relate to life as it is now. In the example, the teacher comments on a source by saying, and some say, uh, well, is that a reliable source? And it certainly is, and some historians interpret it this way. Now let's go on to the material. Yeah, so this is the data that we're working with. And as you said, these are uh, school years six, 11 to 12 year olds. And what we've done is that we've observed, observed um, 11 lessons and collected the final test. And that's what you see in, uh, in front of the, the arrow here. And uh, the ones that we're focusing on during the presentations are the blue ones, in different gray shades of blue here. Um, and the symbols below uh, are to be understood as the main activities in these lessons and the activities that we also have transcribed and uh, analyzed. So in lesson one over here, um, there was work with the textbook and teacher-led interaction. And in lesson five, they also listened to a radio program. And in this uh, lesson nine, they also, apart from talking about the text, they also watched a film. And then we have uh, the the test at the end. Uh, so we'll start there, the first one, and um, most of the teaching generally in this work unit is built around the shared reading of this textbook, which looks like this. And the teacher or student reads a section and they identify together key information or phrases through questions and responses. And this iterative cycle is similar to what Matruglio et al. in 2013 found in their time travel study. Quoting here now, it seems to be motivated by a desire to make sure that students have understood what has been read and to bring to attention points and importance that students need to remember for the future, which we believe is rather typical for history teaching us in Swedish context in a way, I can't talk generally, but it's quite tied to textbooks. So that's sort of ge gen the general setting for textbook work in this class. Lots of reading, close reading, and talking about it together. So looking at some analysis then of uh, what it looked like in relation to our translation device then. And the teacher here has already given a brief orientation of the text and is now reading it, focusing on key information that he's identified prior to the lesson. And the students then are expected to identify this by answering questions. And all answers can then be found in the textbook. So it's not asking for additional knowledge or anything. And in this example here, we see, for, ex for example, uh, that the teacher is unpacking different grammatical metaphors, such as trade with agricultural goods. 
uh, by using frequent verbs, like more frequent verbs, like uh, what was going on, what was happening, what were they doing, uh, which are slightly weaker um, or less specific in order to make all students able to identify the phrases he wants them to identify, which is the agricultural goods from Poland and the Baltic states. In this example, we, we decided that there is nothing that is contextualized through historical or contemporary examples. Uh, so it's sort of the weaker uh, semantic gravity throughout has some why we've got the blue text and the straight font here very close to the textbook. And if we move on to a um, little bit later section of um, this textbook reading, this is what the profile looks for the whole textbook reading that they did. And if we look at the sort of uh, short section, um, the, the, we find also examples when there is a bit of more fluctuation between the weaker semantic gravity and the stronger semantic gravity as in it was like this, Axel Oxen Shana was the chancellor of Sweden at the moment, and then it's unpacked with uh, that is the one who helped. And then a few questions that sort of supporting the students to find the question, he, and the teacher repeats the chancellor terminology and the student gives an answer to what the chancellor is, as in the king's stand-in, which is again, weak semantic gravity as opposed to the explanation of what's, what is what that means, the standing. So, so we've got this movement between the textbook and um, which is, for example, this this is a quote from the textbook. Where is this? The te this is the um, this is a um, student's own construction of the meaning of the standing. And here the teacher further explains this and also adds more information as to what um, this chancellor did in the process. So this is what we've been doing with this uh, lesson sequence. So we'll be looking at a few more examples as moving on to lesson number five, where we have the teacher student interaction and a radio program. And we've got these uh, pictures that look like this. You have the, you see the text as a whole with the coloring and the fonts in different, in either straight font or italicized and so on. And uh, then you get a profile for some of these. So in this extract, we have the teacher narrating an historical event instead of reading from the books. And here again, we see movement between weaker and less weak semantic gravity, the different shades of blue or different fonts of blue, and the stronger semantic gravity in the red. Um, in the first sentence, we have the specific historical knowledge of Sweden then, well, now as well, but then uh, as a hereditary monarchy, which is explained by reference to an early work area, which they did not too long ago, the Brussels area. And then, it's, um, uh, then it is explained in red with uh, what it means. As, uh, you inherit the throne and so on. And we also see some examples of historical commentary where the teacher introduces the students to this, um, the role of the historical sources as uh, for history understanding. And we've interpreted that as a sort of possible basis for developing the historian's gaze as has been suggested by Matruglu et al. Again, we're relying a lot on that source uh, from uh, linguistics and education. So the teacher says, and our, as you saw in the translation device as well, and well, is that a reliable source? Is that a contemporary source? And it certainly is. And some historians interpret it this way, that you're okay with using a diary by the, the then queen to be as um, well, yeah, as a valuable source. Transferring it into the profile, we get something along the lines of this um, sort of SG minus at different levels and uh, SG plus section towards the end there, and so on. So again, we see a bit of movement between uh, these. The retelling is the weakest of 
the semantic gravity and then it sort of becomes more and more impact and concrete and so on. Uh, so some told me to pause and check if things make sense, but I'm sort of thinking, nah, but is it making sense thus far? <laughs> yes, I saw a nod. That's, let's move on. <laughs> I'm taking the opportunity to just use that. Excellent. Right. And the next section of this lesson was this textbook negotiation. And as, again, you can see there's a profile that moves between the uh, weak semantic gravity and the strongest semantic gravity with a few gaps when they change, sort of stop talking about one thing, moving into the next section. Um, and again, it's, it's similar to what I said initially about this iterative cycles that are used to make sure that they understand what they are reading and talking about and it sort of aims further in the future for the exam and so on. Uh, but then we've got the film as well. Oh no, sorry, the radio program. Uh, which is adult radio program, actually, it's not for, for children. And here, this is all blue. As you can see, we have a little bit of commentary uh, of historical commentary that sort of gives us the idea that the Great German War is what we later call the Thirty Years' War, because at the beginning, they didn't know how long it would last, did they? So, and also we refer, we're referred to back to Queen Christine and her uh, being a source to this. And in the profile at the end of the lesson, then we have um, part of this, uh, part of the radio program. The profile shows the whole radio program, but this is only part of uh, our analysis. As you can see, uh, just moving between the weakest of gravity to slightly weaker gravity. Right, and then we have um, our lesson about the witch trials, which is for anybody at this you know, working in this workout, the most interesting stuff. This is full of action. So um, there's a textbook reading interaction section and also the radio program that we talk about. And um, here uh, we begin with the teacher telling the students about this picture that's in the textbook that's sort of like top of the, of the book and he introduces this uh, picture and says and there we have a picture where you see a child pointing to a standing woman who is moaning and very upset and a priest standing to her left so it just gives us the context for this and it's italicized here because it's to do with the history and knowledge but it's context slightly more contextualized than had there not been a picture and so on um, and then he continues to read out loud from the book, uh, moving, moving them back, uh, sort of up, making it weak, even weaker in the gra semantic gravity. And I apologize for some misspellings here. We're both working with very small screens at the moment, so it's sort of difficult to see the <laughs> letters and so on. Um, so the teacher then explains about the terminology because here we hear a central thing about the witch trials, of course, is the superstition and the mix up with the, what the Bible says and other fairy tales and stories and things. So he talks about what superstition means and that it means that you believe that supernatural things can happen, things that cannot be described scientifically. And also he makes this um, uh, historical commentary about that at this time people were very uh, were many unnatural what well, people believed in many unnatural things towards the end and just to make uh, students understand that while well, superstition is the, is a lot of the cause behind this and yet again trying out this as a profile we have have it like this so slightly weaker in gravity to even weaker gravity and then down into the context slightly more context embedded when you relate to sort of a general understanding that applies today as well 
I'm sorry. And then to conclude these lessons, we have um, this uh, extract from the film, which is um, uh, used to people, two voices, sort of a child's voice and an adult voice, and then of course music and background images and big fires and flames and so on. Um, and here again, we can see from the coloring that this uh, it, the, the spoken text in the film moves between stronger and weaker semantic gravity, mixing the specific historical content about the witch trials and more unpacking of that and also everyday examples or comparisons of today. For example, the child's voice here in the beginning. In the 17th century, rumors spread that there were witches. Most of the accused were women. And during a few years, 300 people were executed. No one was guilty and there was no legal certainty. And then sort of a more general comment to that from the adult. It is always hor very horrible when a person is executed and killed. And then it goes on back and forth a bit, up and down. Um, and here we suggest in the corners again with Matruglia tell that we see an example where students can be trained in seeing the witch trials from both an insider's and an outsider's perspective and think about what the students then might do in a similar situation. As in, what would you do if someone had set fire to your school? It would be scary and many want to find a culprit. And then imagine it, everyone says it was your friend who did it. And there you have both the outside and the inside perspective. Who's, what will they do? And this final darker blue section and then this profile, again, we see that there is it's just part of this initial, uh, initial section, how it, how it looks transferred into profile. And the continuation of the film is similar. You move between these, um, these different levels and uh, both adult and child take both sides, so to speak, both provide the specific historical knowledge and the everyday understanding. And, well, um, we're going to quote Matruglia et al. again with the com communication in the film bobbing up and down the semantic scale. Sometimes perhaps it's even more than bobbing. It's quite big waves we're surfing here. So these are then three examples of this type of interaction or communication and content that the pupils have met during this um, uh, work unit. And then it concludes in this um, test, um, which is all in writing. It's, um, it's sort of like the grand finale of any work unit. And we've selected some, um, some uh, examples of student tests to sort of try and look at this second aim of the study to examine how students then realize you can textualized and contextualized history knowledge in the written exam. Um, and um, now we've not translated the actual responses or the questions. So you sort of have to rely on our comments in the, in, the, in the graph. But the test asks the students to give two causes to and two consequences of the war in the 1600s. Now, cause and consequence is essential in the Swedish curriculum and history. So there were quite a few questions where they had to show this knowledge. And what we see when we look at the, this example, for example, uh, this student response for these, um, this, we see that there is an unpacking going on between more the specific knowledge and then an explanation which is more his historical than every day. King wanted more power and therefore there were many wars. And those who lived in Sweden went to war. Many men died and the women had to manage the farms and so on. So it's all related to the history then, either specific or general at the time, and not, nothing relating to today. And another task asked them to uh, 
explain how we can see today the changes that the Chancellor Axel Uxel Schöner then uh, introduced and changed Sweden's organization in many ways. And um, for example, in this first response, Axel Uxel Schöner is um, sort of repeats the, the, the question, he's made changes to the organization. And then there are examples that are re relevant for today. I mean, this is what the, the student was asked to do. So it's just right. We want that, we want to go all the way down in relation to, to um, our translation device, that these are examples that Axel Uxel Schöner, he introduced the post, introduced newspapers and so on. Um, and the second question they've been asked to tell about the Queen Christina using certain um, certain terminology. And we have one example here where the student writes that the Queen abdicated and then unpacks it and explains and shows that the student knows what abdicated mean. Well, it means to stop ruling and so on. So we see again, that the history knowledge specific or slightly more general is sort of in focus in their responses. And the final example from the test um, where they are asked again to write causes to and consequences of the witch trials using a table which they also were introduced to in, in lessons, trying to find but an event and relate that to cause and consequences in different ways. And then this is what it turned out like in the, uh, in the text, where we have a, again um, a profile that sort of stays in the blue and starts with the vitalized kids mixed Bible fairy tales and fantasy, which is the cause. And then we have the specific witch trials, which was very particular for them and then examples of one of the consequences that came from it. So these were our examples. And from this, we've drawn some conclusions, haven't we, Susanne? We have. So to the first questions, how do students encounter the contextualized and contextualized content in primary school history teaching, as in these examples? We saw that students are mostly exposed to weaker semantic gravity through textbooks, radio and film and participate by unpacking it to stronger semantic gravity with the help of teacher interaction. Where, and in terms of what they themselves produce in the written exams, we can see that the students' responses are mainly SG minus focusing the expected historical knowledge, moving between SG minus minus and SG minus, but not really comparing it to things nowadays, which would count for in our translation device as uh, larger or higher semantic gravity. So it's just a couple of lessons we've analyzed this far for the conference and, and what we can see is they provide few opportunities for students to repack the content again. This is mostly done by the teacher or a film or a radio program. Well, what you could call the historical authorities in the classroom. So, um, and this, in, in, on the other hand, the test only allows for short answers. So they're not, there are not too many opportunities for the students to relate to common knowledge and to compare it to nowadays. Um, things that they have done orally in the classroom, but, but in writing, they are not expected to produce that yet. And of course, you can discuss whether that would be reasonable to do in year six or not. We can also see how the interplay between then and now, um, which our blue and red marking shows, is, is used to understand then and also how these 12 year olds are introduced to, well, at least the, the beginning of a historical gaze through mainly through the teacher's comments on sources or how history is interpreted. It is very clear from the 11 week we've been there that this is not geography where things uh, are more, <laughs> well, 
sort of factual. Uh, it's it, there's always all the time there there are these comments on on interpretations that sort of. So I I and we when I talked to the teacher about it, he was not even aware of the difference between the subjects. But it's 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 very clear to me that it's subject specific, and all this is of course important as it goes as feedback into the to the project and the teachers that have been involved in this teaching. And finally, uh, we have a little uh, um, added note that semantic gravity was, was actually a, a forced or a wished analytical lens for this session. So we're now looking forward to try other LCT dimensions on this material, which might be more suitable. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Right, and this is the end of the big great era with the, the king being carried home from the war. So. so can I ask a question here? Um, have, have we got time just to check with uh, that? Because I don't see any time. So we have, uh, uh, okay. th we have three minutes. Actually. Three minutes, all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 which would be your next um, LCT concept that you'd uh, that you you keen to try out, and 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 why that one? Um, I'd be very interested just to hear, because so many things come to mind. So, I, I'm just interested in where 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 you would go, having having really looked at the semantic gravity so so carefully. Thank you. Well, the thing is, we haven't really decided, but we started out discussing autonomy uh, as, I mean, the moving between now and then, as I said, was an interesting part of it. And there are also other parallels being drawn that might be interesting to look at from a, an autonomy. But maybe you have propositions. We, I mean, I'm sure we don't see all the possibilities that are there. Yeah. No, I think that that's a really great place to start. Awesome. I look forward to, to seeing how that unfolds. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you. So can we continue without a break or you take a break when you when you need or shall we start in a couple of minutes? Shall we continue? Yeah, um, the, the idea is to keep, keep going. Yeah, so I will start sharing my screen then. Oh, let's see. Yes. So can you all see the screen now? Hopefully, yes, we have no. So, uh, this presentation uh, is called Nature and Nurture Teachers' Semantic Work to Establish Knowledge about Epigenetics on Different Organizational Levels. The presentation reports a study where two teachers are introducing front end research about epigenetics to students in upper secondary school. This area of content challenges former teaching of genetics and the nature and nurture relationship. Further, it highlights issues, how to handle a degree of uncertainty in regard to the scientific findings of this research. In biology education, knowledge building is argued to evolve over different organizational levels, from a micro to molecular level, to a uh, phenomenon level. To scaffold knowledge building, students' opportunity to make connections and relations between different levels are highlighted. Um, if you have questions or comments during the presentation, please post them in the chat during, during the presentation. They will be very helpful in the future work. And I will try to answer some questions raised on the presentation. Oh my. 
かね。そう。In the teaching、uh, module, three learning objects are highlighted. First, students need to make a shift in their understanding from nature versus nature to nature and nature. Epigenetics has shown how the environment interacts with the genome and thereby challenged all genetic deterministic conceptions within biological theory and education. Second, students need to understand what environmental factors might affect the genetic patterns in the cells. In order to inform personal decision making. Third, students are supposed to gain knowledge about some of the most studied types of epigenetic mechanisms on a theoretical level methylation of DNA and modifications of histones. The three learning objects address thereby both a micro level and a phenomenon level. The learning objects are examined by the ways they are semantically coded in teaching. The aim of this study is to examine the, exam this, the semantic work of the teachers in order to scaffold the students' knowledge building about epigenetics. Following three research questions. What semantic work is performed by the teacher when establishing a learning object on a phenomenal level? What well, semantic work is performed by the teachers, teacher when establishing a learning object on the micro level, and what well, semantic work is performed by the teacher to connect a phenomenon and a micro level. This presentation reports finding from a design study about how to implement epigenetics in school biology in a teaching module to make it accessible for students to learn. The data consists of video recordings from two classes at a science program in upper secondary school. It, um, it focuses two teachers' introduction of the content area of epigenetics in their first lesson in this module. The analysis rests on transcripts of video recordings. There are also additional material here, uh, the teacher's PowerPoint presentation. In this uh, presentation, semantics is used as an analytical tool, as you know, to examine the teacher's semantic work. Um, it is argued that knowledge building support is through semantics caused by the strengthening and weakening of semantic density and the strengthening and weakening of semantic gravity. Semantic density in teaching is typically strengthened by the use of scientific concepts or grammatical constructions, such as nominalizations or nominal groups, and weakened by the use of more everyday language. Semantic gravity is typically strengthened when the meaning is tied to a concrete ex uh, phenomenon or example, and weakened by generalization and abstract reasoning. The four, um, when combined in a semantic plane, the four quadrants create four different typological codes or ways of, to represent the object semantically. Two of these codes resemble Bernstein's concept of vertical and horizontal discourses termed rhizomatic and prosaic within the framework. Two other codes highlight a specialized code where a technical language is tied to a limited context and a generic code where an everyday language is used to express abstractions or generalizations. These two codes are termed differently in regard to the mo most or more established terms, rarefied and worldly. It's adapted from Lundqvist and Carlson and mirrors the empirical data of this study and other studies where we have uh, built on Shea's construction of the semantic plane. In this slide, our translation device is presented. Uh, the translation device shows how the semantic relations and codes are realized in the specific research context. First criteria indicators are presented, then example codes from the empirical data. 
The translation device can also be read from right to the left, showing how the engagement with and immersion in data during the process is condensed into categories that enable generalizations and anchor the empirical data in theory. So DNA methylation can inactivate the following gene sequence, visualizes rhizomatic code. I think most of current genetic engineering technique is about trying to delete genetic elements of a specific gene, visualize a specialized code. We don't know everything about this yet, but research has proven that specific patterns can affect next generation, visualizes the generic code. And if you have more money, you can afford better food for example, organic food is often more expensive and, uh, than, and other food could be sprayed and full of chemicals. That can affect your body in a negative way, visualizes a prosaic code. The teachers construct exercises together with a researcher that aim at helping students to shift from nature versus nature to nature and nature. At the beginning of the first lesson, the students are encouraged to discuss and decide whether different features, length, blood type, strength, musicality and esprit are caused by biological factors or by environmental or social factors. A similar exercise is carried out at the beginning of the second lesson. In this exercise, Photos of two pair of twins are shown to the students. The students are asked to discuss why the elderly twins differ, even when they, in principle, have an identical DNA. Both exercises allows the students to strengthen and weaken the semantic gravity. In the first exercise, the students' talk moves back and forth from personal experiences to abstract statements concerning the features exemplified. In the second exercise, they describe the pictures of the twins in a concrete manner and make judgment and conclusions about twins in general. However, these shifts in semantic gravity has no correspondence in weakening or strengthening of density in the students' talk. Instead, more of an everyday language is used. exercises are followed by a short lecture. This lecture is focused in the following presentation. In their introduction, um, the teachers, the two teachers focus on the first learning object, the shift from nature versus nature to nature and nature. Teachers, the students distinguished as dependent on either biology or environment in the first exercise are problematized. The teachers emphasize that the state of knowledge is a bit unsure, that it is a quite new research field, uh, that the research is in its, in its infancy, but that the findings force us to reconsider what we use to explain as biology. Most students seem to accept this new knowledge presented as epigenetic mechanisms caused by environmental factors influencing the gene activity. However, it is also challenged by a couple of students in the classroom dialogue. I kind of think if your mother or father is an alcoholic, you're in danger to develop alcoholism in the future. Well, that has really nothing to do with the genetics. To be honest, it sounds like as if my dad were an astronaut, I would also become an astronaut. Hmm. If you really try to summarize epigenetic mechanisms and patterns de facto have to methylate this DNA since it can move to the next generation. Hmm. Well, we don't know everything. Just think about the picture of an iceberg. We only discovered the tip of the iceberg of epigenetics. We can imagine a bit what epigenetics means to us or how we can affect and adjust our actions to try to control these mechanisms. But there is still much to learn. 
For example, there are so many diseases that you might be able to clarify. Why does this specific epigenetic pattern take my genome? And can I make any decisions that might change this pattern? We know they can remain over generations. Some patterns remain. That's something to consider if you want to have children in the future. The choices I make now might influence that. The choice of occupation to be an astronaut or not is probably not part of this, but the way we live can affect the next generation. Transformed into a semantic profile, this elaboration takes the form of a semantic wave. The two students raise one question each, one more general, one, and one more concrete, two. The teacher moves quite quickly from the concrete example of the, to the scientific explanation, three. Then the teacher modifies what we know at present, but stresses that we for certain know that epigenetic mechanisms affect next generation, that is, what the students question. The teacher states this twice, four and five. Then he gives an argument about why this knowledge can be important in life, six, and arrives finally at the concrete level that the students took as departure and answer their questions, seven and eight. The students do not make any further comments. In his answer, uh, semantic density as well as semantic gravity is strengthened and weakened by the teacher. And the student's entry point is met in the teacher's exit point. The second learning object, what are environmental factors might affect the, epigenetic, the genetic patterns in the cells is introduced by an image of a human body surrounded by different objects representing 10 different environmental factors. The teacher's instruction focuses these factors and the responsibility of everyone to seek a healthy lifestyle. And intellectual input, social interactions with friends and family have impact as medication, gastrointestinal systems, or how your stomach works. Your body is also affected by the food, of course. It affects the genetic patterns. This learning object focuses the phenomenon level. The semantic density is relatively weak, though many of the everyday words used are consolidated rather than common. That is, nominalizations and nominal groups are prevalent. Like in this example, the environmental factors that we see here, some are already mentioned, like exercise, poisonous chemicals, and food. But there are also other things that we experience in life. Further, there seems to be a need to establish and use some scientific concepts also on this level. Besides the subject area itself, epigenetics, gene, DNA, protein, and cell are used. However, the linguistic context is less dense when these concepts are used on a phenomenon level than when they are used on a micro level. Instead of talking about genes being methylated, constructions like genes are turned on and off are used. I'll say this picture, we have something called gene regulation. There are a couple of genes which are turned on and off throughout life. In doing so, they cause different effects on the body. The third learning object, epigenetic mechanisms and its impact on gene expression is introduced by a schematic drawing of two such mechanisms, DNA methylation and histone modification. The teacher's instruction mainly focuses focused the student's understanding of these mechanisms. The language is dense and several scientific concepts are used. Here you see the sequence where the transcription of a gene begins, the promoter. However, something called methyl groups can tag the DNA. The methyl groups act as a kind of stop sign. They silence the gene. 
A methylated gene means no gene expression. The talk is scaffolded by an interplay with the schematic drawing and the students are requested to pay attention to different parts of this drawing. There are also semantic moves where the teachers explicitly signal that they are moving from the former phenomenal level to the present micro level. In such transitions, the density is strengthened, for example, through grammatical metaphors like nominalization. Let's scale down and investigate how it really looks. This is about how you activate or silence genes, how a gene is activated, what affect gene activity. This part of the first lesson where first environmental factors and second two epigenetic mechanisms are presented and introduced by the teachers. Takes teacher A about 11 minutes and teacher B about 20 minutes. They both use the same slides and carry out the same move from a phenomenon to a micro level in their instruction. On these two organizational levels, a different semantic work is performed. On the phenomenon level, a generic code is prominent. The teachers mainly use an everyday language and their utterances are relatively context independent with references to expert knowledge. They make general and abstract statements about this new research field and how it challenges a form of deterministic view of genetics. Further, they emphasize its impact and relevance to many areas of human life and how this knowledge can inform people to make well-founded decisions. Some theoretical concepts are used. These concepts are given meaning in an everyday language context and consist of compact technical words that are common and well-established, like genes, protein, cell, and DNA. In a simple Google search in Swedish, these concepts get far more hits than many of the consolidated everyday words that the teachers are using, like exercise, health, or sickness. Discursive moves are made above all by teacher B, who strengthens and weakens the semantic density, particularly by the use of conglomerate technical words like gene regulation or epigenetic patterns. In the middle of this poster is a human being with body and mental states, health, well-being, learning. Outside this body, we have something called the gene regulation. There are genes that throughout life are turned on and off. This affects the human being, the body, well, and other parts too. This in turn is ruled by epigenetic patterns controlled by the gene regulation. Teacher B holds a monologue stating facts. Teacher A uses more of a dialogue, asking the students what they think. Well, we talked about medicines, what the intestinal package looks like, infection, illness, drugs, exercise, economic status. Can you inherit that? What do you think? Can these factors affect the genes? The students are posing their questions or making remarks from the same linguistic position as the teacher. There are, a few, there are a few moves along the Y axis where the semantic gravity is strengthened and weakened in this part of the lesson. The prosaic code is first and foremost used for procedural matters in class. However, in lesson two, where the same move from a phenomenon level to a micro level is identified, there is also a shift at the phenomenon level between more concrete and more abstract utterances. So to summarize, when establishing a learning object of a phenomenon level, the two teachers mainly use the generic code. The figure visualizes the utterances displayed in the semantic plane. Italic letters are used for teacher A and upright letters for teacher B. Students' utterances are underlined. The double-ended arrow symbolizes the most frequent discursive move identified.
On the micro level, a rhizomatic code is prominent. The teachers mainly use a specialized language and their utterances are relatively context independent. Technical concepts are frequently used and tied to, one to other concepts of the field. Both teachers use about 20 different concepts during this quite short teaching sequence when they introduce two epigenetic mechanisms, DNA methylation and histone modification. The concepts used are given meaning within their specialized domain. Some concepts are so-called conglomerate or compounds. They are even more dense because of the specific meaning that is created when two or more words or parts of meaning are combined. Discursive moves are mainly performed by the weakening and strengthening of semantic density. In the following example, teacher B, defines what epigenetics is about, moving from an everyday language to a specialized language and back to an everyday language. Epigenetics is about activating and silencing genes. In other words, epigenetic mechanisms regulate gene activity. If the gene should be talking or remain silent. On the micro level, both teachers lecture the students' utterances are mainly part of an IRE sequence where the teachers control facts about the process of gene expression. What is the function of enzymes? Chemical reactions. They handle chemical reactions. The enzymes accelerate these chemical reactions. Though some students are also posing questions. These questions are following the current semantic orientation and organizational level, in this case, the micro level. So high stone modification generally activates genes. I would say both these processes, DNA methylation and high stone modification can happen because of environmental factors affecting the genes. In his answer, teacher B elaborates upon what causes these processes or mechanisms, namely, and they, <laughs> namely environmental factors. In doing so, he's linking the micro level to the phenomenon level. This answer ends his lecture at the same point as he started 20 minutes earlier. That environmental factors can affect gene activity. The use of a specialized code is rare. However, there are some examples. Once, where teacher A reminds the students of a laboratory exercise about DNA, and once, where teacher B illustrates the relation between gene activity and the production of muscle protein. Further, one student initiates a discursive move, strengthening the semantic dense, uh, gravity through a question about potential applications of this research. Can uh, you do this in a laboratory as well? Can you take a DNA sequence? And the teacher answers, well, I don't really know if you can silence a gene by adding, hmm, I'm unsure if you can methylate a gene. I think most of current genetic engineering techniques Did you do? Hello? about trying to delete genetic elements of a specific gene. Yes. I think that was a mistake on this team. Oh, sorry. So to summarize, uh, when establishing a learning object on a micro level, the two teachers mainly use a rhizomatic code. The figure visualizes the utterances uh, displayed in a semantic plane. Italic letters are used for teacher A and upright letters for teacher B. Students' utterances are underlined. The double-ended arrow symbolizes the most frequent discursive move identified. In these two lessons observed, where epigenetics is introduced, the semantic work performed by the teachers mainly relies on a strengthening and weakening of semantic density. A strengthening or weakening of semantic gravity is less frequent. One could argue that the instruction focuses concrete matters, for example, different environmental factors are highlighted, and two specific 
epigenetic mechanisms are explained. However, the instruction seems to aim at establishing knowledge that is generalizable rather than knowledge that is tied to specific examples or individual experience. Further, two different codes are used. One generic code for the phenomenon level and a rhizomatic code for the micro level. To establish a learning object of phenomenon level, the use of an everyday language seems to be sufficient, though all words used are not common. Rather, there are words that could be described as consolidated. There also seems to be a need to master some technical words connected to the field. To establish a learning object of a micro level, the use of a specialized language is crucial. The handful of technical words used on a phenomenon level are insufficient to describe and explain epigenetic mechanisms. On the micro level, technical words like high stone tail, methyl group, and RNA polymerase are used. The discourse is scaffolded by schematic drawings, and the teachers are weakening the semantic density by repeating some of the information in an everyday language. The students seem to follow these semantic shifts from a phenomenon to a micro level. However, their contribution to the dialogue decreases on the micro level. These findings rely mainly on a qualitative text analysis. However, a quantitative text analysis shows the same pattern. There is a distinct difference in semantic density when the teachers make a shift from a phenomenon to a micro level. This example illustrates teacher B's instruction. On a phenomenon level, 16% of the words that he uses are not found among the 5,000 most frequent words in the shows and corpus. On a micro level, almost 25% of the words that he uses are not found among the 5,000 most frequent words in this corpus. And the corpus is a blog mix. In science education, it is argued, as I mentioned in, at the beginning, that different organizational levels should be connected to one another. The analysis of teachers' semantic works work to establish knowledge on a phenomenon at a micro level indicates that there is a need for discursive mobility to accomplish that. Rather than docking into each other, the codes used for the two levels visibly differs in the lessons analyzed. However, three strategies used by the teachers to connect the two levels are identified. The elaboration of an answer. Um, if you really try to summarize a genetic mechanism and patterns, the fact to have to metallize this DNA since it can move to the next generation and so forth. Um, the explicit reference to a transition point. Uh, both teachers make it explicit when they move from a phenomenon to a micro level, what I have chosen to term a transition. Let's scale it down and investigate how it really looks. This is about how you activate or silence, gene, silence genes, how a gene is activated what affect gene activity and teacher B. So now, so we have touched upon this quite superficially. Now we'll dig deeper into what's, what it's all about. And um, transformation of some technical concepts to an everyday con uh, context. Um, where this technical con Sets are transformed from their specialization domain to, to commonplace context. This concept might reach the two levels and, and act almost as a kind of boundary objects. Teacher A. Infection, illness, drugs, exercise, economic status. What do you think? Can these factors affect the genes? And teacher B. There are genes that throughout life are turned on and off. This affects the human being, the body. To sum up, 
to handle learning objects about epigenetics, a phenomenon as well as a micro level is established by the teacher. In the introduction of the subject area, there is a movement from a phenomenon to a micro level. The change of levels is made explicit in instruction. For the two levels, different codes are used, a generic code for the phenomenon level and a rhizomatic code for the micro level. The discursive moves are mainly carried out through a strengthening and weakening of semantic density. To connect different levels, three different strategies are identified. Collaborations, where semantic gravity as well as semantic density is varied, resulting in semantic waves. Explicit reference to a transition point and transformation of technical concepts to an everyday context. Thanks. So there were many technical concepts in this presentation. Uh, biology is not my, uh, my research field. So uh, I, uh, I try to, to look at it from a semantic point of view. I don't know if it did make sense. So thanks a lot for, for uh, following this presentation. So I hand over to Tanja. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me and uh, can you see my screen? Is everything okay? Good, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Tanja Velsot and uh, I'm from Aarhus University in Denmark and uh, I'm going to talk about autonomy, semantics and inclusion in international higher education. And uh, it means that uh, we're changing focus quite a lot from, uh, from what we have just heard and uh, we're also sort of uh, changing uh, levels um, because my project was originally not um, a legitimation code theory. It was something that came in quite late. So I'll try to introduce my, my project before I, um, well, to sort of explain uh, where all of this comes from. Um, the data that I'm presenting or that I'm drawing upon is the data from a project that uh, originally, it still researches the recognition, acknowledgement and negotiation of knowledge among students that participate in international education. And uh, this uh, data or this project is part of a larger project that researches internationalization more generally um, as, as practice at the Aarhus University in Denmark as a case. So we have a number of, of different projects that are contributing to this larger project. And uh, all of it is uh, a Bajorian project um, and uh, so is mine. And uh, <laughs> uh, it, well, it still is, but I also, uh, when I started analyzing my data, I recognized or I realized that I needed some sort of language to describe uh, knowledge internal structures instead of the social recognition in the field that, uh, that we can uh, draw upon from Poju. Um, so uh, LCT was not originally part of this project, but since I needed this, uh, this language, I started looking um, and I tried at first, uh, initially I tried with some sort of uh, closed open-ended dichotomy in order to describe the different kinds of language structures, but I could also see that it wasn't enough. Uh, and that is when I uh, discovered or was introduced to um, legitimation code theory. Um, so I use the knowledge structures as uh, structuring practices um, for including, uh, for recognition and for acknowledgement and negotiation of knowledge. It also means that, uh, that the data wasn't produced uh, with this, uh, this in mind, with the LCT in mind, but I still think it has uh, some, some valuable insights uh, that, uh, that I would like to share. Um, good, um, to move on. The, the data that I have here 
is um, observations. I have approximately data from 19 hours of teaching situations from three international master programs. And these were 90 hours that I did myself. And then it was also actually supplemented a little bit with the observations and data from, from a colleague. Um, then I have uh, 19 qualitative interviews with the students from the same programs. And I draw a little bit also upon um, secondary data produced by other members of the project group. And that is a survey about the social, cultural and educational background of students that participate in international education in Aarhus. And it is interviews with lecturers from the same programs that I have data from. And I'll say a little bit more about this picture in a minute, but I just want to mention that this is uh, Aarhus University and it's actually the building where I have my office. It's right behind this uh, red square here in the corner. Uh, so, so that's where I'm based. Um, just to give you an impression of, uh, of what it looks like at Aarhus University. Um, as I said before, we use Bourdieu's educational sociology as a main framework uh, for, for this, uh, this project. And uh, what I find interesting here and what I also draw upon in relation to what I'm going to talk about today um, is that there's, um, there's a relationship according to Bourdieu, between autonomy, uh, pedagogic authority, and pedagogic act action. We know that uh, pedagogic authority is a precondition for pedagogic action. But this authority depends upon a number of, of different things, or it can be influenced uh, by a number of different things. Uh, it can be influenced by, or it depends upon recognition in the, in the symbolic or the economic market. It depends upon a homogeneous student group uh, whose knowledge habitus is in congruence with the knowledge or the cultural arbitrary that is presented at the program. And then it depends upon a relatively autonomous position. Um, and if pedagogic authority is absent, it can lead to struggle among the students. And that is why authority and autonomy and these ideas that I have presented here are important to, to research and to look into when, uh, when we're analyzing these encounters between students and between students and lecturers in the classroom. Um, and what I discovered in my project was, uh, or in my data, was that uh, I could definitely see also when I analyzed the data with uh, the decimation codes that uh, the, this congruence in knowledge habitus is a source of authority. It is much easier to establish authority if the students in the classroom have a relatively similar kind of uh, educational or knowledge background. And this could both be in relation to uh, knowledge and knower codes, um, or it could be uh, in relation to, uh, to semantic gravity. Um, but that is not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about something that I'm beginning to explore, uh, something that I'm thinking about, and something that I'm trying to, uh, to make sense of. Um, and uh, it is when we look at autonomy as a source of uh, pedagogic, pedagogic authority, um, and in my data, it seems to, to be the case, or it is the case that autonomy is a source of, uh, of authority. But in some of the cases, in parts of the data, it's also something that is conditioned by what I have called a horizontal heteronomy. Um, and today I'm going to explore what uh, these relationships between autonomy, semantics and inclusion might be or how they can be identified in the data. Because in my original analysis, I haven't really focused, focused that much on, uh, on semantics, um, but it's definitely something that is there. And it's something that, uh, that I think could be interesting to look into in more detail. As I said, this is a work in progress and uh, some of it is still um, something that I'm working on. And uh, if what I'm saying isn't uh, entirely clear, you're very welcome to interrupt me. I don't mind being uh, interrupted while I speak. So just uh, don't hesitate to, to ask if there's something that's unclear. Uh, in order to find out, first of all, this relationship between authority and autonomy, I have looked into uh, these differences between positional autonomy and relational autonomy. And there's certainly something that, uh, that are important in the analysis. Um, and you'll also see that when, when I move on in a second. Um, but besides that, I also think it is important or interesting to look into sort of the direction of autonomy, um, because it can both be an autonomy from, uh, from a hierarchy, uh, or it could be an autonomy from uh, some sort of horizontal relationship. 
And uh, talking about the hierarchical uh, direction of autonomy, uh, what I mean is that I analyzed data uh, as, uh, or the encounters as something that take place in a larger field. So we have the classrooms, we have um, education, we have Aarhus University as, uh, as a field that is inscribed into a larger field or uh, both a larger field and it's national field of, uh, of higher education, but it's also something that relates to a global field of power. Uh, where there are so certain ideas about uh, what knowledge should be produced and uh, for what purposes. And when I'm talking about uh, autonomy in the hierarchical direction, I'm talking about an autonomy from um, the values or the ideas, the epistemologies of the global field. Um, and I said before that I would uh, return to this image. Um, I'm doing that because I actually I found this uh, or I took this uh, photograph while I was producing my data and what I think is really interesting here is that you can actually see this um, this field you can see the influence of the field upon the university we have here the department of, of business communication your future in business starts here so here there is an orientation towards uh, the external field or the global field of power we have um, an educational program that is produced um, for the purposes of, uh, of, well, preparing students for jobs after university. The red square uh, that you can see at, at the corner is actually the symbol of um, a student protest movement that argues for uh, freedom from the global field of power in relation to determining uh, the purposes of the university. So it's there, uh, but it's, it's significantly smaller uh, than the banner from the uh, from the global field or representing the global field, the inscription of the university into this global field of power. So when I'm talking about uh, the hierarchical direction of autonomy, it is this relationship to the field of power that I'm talking about. On the other hand, when we're talking about internationalization and some of the ideas that are embedded in uh, internationalization of higher education, it means that, uh, or the consequence is that uh, that internationalization as a process uh, means that uh, we, we not only have students that are present in our classrooms, but they also bring knowledge from other fields. Um, and it's something that we need to, to encounter or we need to think about how it is encountered in the classroom. Um, they bring, of course, both uh, theory from their previous education and they bring uh, some sort of contextually embedded knowledge. And this is where we are beginning to talk a little bit about the semantics. Um, because the question is then, how is this knowledge recognized and integrated as part of international education? Um, and I see this as a process that unfolds both in relation to, uh, to the hierarchical direction of autonomy, especially in relation to uh, relational autonomy, but it's also a process which seems to have uh, different semantic views on the international students, depending on this hierarchical direction of autonomy. Yeah. This is a translation device that I have tried to, to work on and I haven't finished it. Um, but my intention here is to, to show that, it, uh, that I'm working with, uh, with definitions of the concepts, both in relation to, to the hierarchical uh, direction and the horizontal uh, direction. As I said in the beginning, I have data from three different programs. Uh, I have chosen today to focus on two of them because uh, I have a lot of data and also because they're, they're the two programs that are the most interesting in relation to, to talking about different ways of, uh, of integrating the international student or acknowledging the knowledge of the international student. The third program that I have is more a program where uh, the international student needs to become uh, socialized entirely into uh, the knowledge framework uh, of, of the program. Um, the other two programs that I'm talking about today are programs that uh, in theory try to integrate and interact with the knowledge that the international students bring. But if we look at how they're legitimated, um, the first program is uh, a program that uh, is uh, highly interdisciplinary. 
It combines anthropology, political science, and biology, but it is legitimated. It is uh, in, uh, in the relational autonomy, it is oriented towards job market relevance. It is very much how they talk about uh, the purpose of the program to find jobs for the students. And they're talking about how there is a job market for this kind of students. And they legitimate the knowledge that they produce, the knowledge itself. It is legitimated very much in uh, problems that we find in the real world and not the problems of the university. So there's an external uh, legitimation or uh, a weak relational uh, autonomy when we're looking at the hierarchical direction. Then what I'm interested in and what I'm trying to find out more about is uh, how it interacts with the horizontal relations of autonomy, but also when we look at the, the semantic view that the, that the programs have uh, upon the international students. Um, in terms of uh, positional autonomy, uh, you can look at it in this way that, the, that some of the international students uh, participate in the program because they're aiming at a career in Danish academia, but they're very, consequently not granted access to the field or their characters, their roles are not uh, allowed access to the, the Danish field. They're only there as students and then they're uh, asked to leave again. Um, there's also this uh, sense of, uh, well, we use the knowledge and the experiences from other field, fields in, uh, in the programs, they're using it uh, when they're talking about biology, they're using the international students to exemplify the kind of, of concepts that they're talking about. Uh, they're trying to get them to talk about them from, from their perspectives. But they're, they're seen as such, they're seen as, um, as representatives of a local context. And the purpose of uh, including the international students is uh, for the purpose of illustrating a point made by the lecturers. Um, then we also see that uh, that when students are trying to introduce knowledge from their previous education, it could, for instance, be an example here uh, from a student that calls for critical thinking, and he does that with uh, with reference to his uh, previous educational background as uh, as a philosopher. Um, he's bringing in theoretical explanations, um, theories that he has been introduced to before. Um, but he's also complaining that, uh, that they're not recognizing this kind of, of thinking that he is bringing. Um, there's no room for that at the program. And he describes it in this way, uh, that uh, they are talking about, uh, or they're talking quite a lot about human rights at the program. It is seen as a good thing, uh, which in, <laughs> in theory he also agrees with. But then he says, but there are no questions asked. It's always just we, we make the statement that human rights is a good thing, and then we move on without discussion. Uh, and he also says, we are immediately followed, uh, funneled in the direction of the knowledge that, uh, that the program represents. So while they do try to connect to the knowledge of, of the international students, it is only done for very specific purposes that have already been defined by the program itself. Um, and as I said here, uh, the international student is granted access, but as an empirical object on the teacher's conditions. Um, an empirical object that needs to be uh, adapted to the teacher's aims. Um, and there's an example here, and this is an example, it's a quote from, uh, from an interview with, uh, with one of the students that, uh, that participate in the program. And what she says is that if we're talking about developing countries, then the attention will go to the students from the developing countries, just pointing their eyes at them. And here she's talking about the teachers. So uh, there's this relationship in class that, they, that when we're talking about developing countries, uh, students from developing countries are expected to contribute with uh, experiences from these countries. Um, and in consequence, and this is where uh, I think this is really, it is interesting in relation to some of the things that we have seen uh, from, from Bojo, is that uh, when there isn't um, autonomy in the, in the hierarchical sense in this case, uh, we risk a sense of fragmentation, um, a sense of uh, conflict among the students. 
Um, and that this program, it actually ends in actual conflict um, on a number of levels. But here I have included a, a quote from an interview with, uh, with an African student. And uh, it's a quote that illustrates how his knowledge, what he's talking about here is how his knowledge remains uh, this context bound knowledge that can't really integrate with, uh, with the knowledge of the other students. And what he says is that um, sometimes it is difficult to draw upon others' knowledge, even though we try. Most times I draw upon my background because I can't actually know much about environmental studies. So even though he's in this program, he's not ex experiencing that he has a right to, uh, to go in and develop, to, uh, to discuss um, the, the course and its knowledge from a more theoretical point of view. Um, we try to make it work. And as long as it explains well, the other person trying to explain his point of view. And I also try to explain my point of view. We try to integrate it, though sometimes it is, it is difficult. Um, and then he talks about the different motivations for being in the program. But what is really the, the experience of these students in the program is that they, they can't find a way to integrate all of these very different kinds of knowledge. Uh, but there's also this sense of, uh, of a strong hierarchy in relation to who has the right to theorize. Um, and this is what we see here in, um, in the next quote. I think it's the last slide from this program. Um, and uh, what he says here is that, uh, but I have seen some instances of European students and they're studying more into African politics in Asia because there they have an advantage. So he's very much explaining how European students have a right to go into studies uh, in fields that, that they haven't been born into uh, and they have the right to, to develop theory in this field. Um, and then he says, in contrast, he did European or I did European history uh, that was in secondary uh, and it was compulsory, but he can't use it for any professional purposes because um, it, is, uh, it is a situation where he isn't recognized as an authority on, uh, on the knowledge, but on the other hand, um, the European students will be recognized as authorities on, uh, on African or on, on African conditions. Um, no, it wasn't the last slide. This is also a slide from, uh, from the same program. And it is, uh, it is a quote, uh, or it is, uh, it is something from, uh, from the observations of, uh, of classroom interactions. And it also shows how we have this uh, fragmentation, um, the, the sense that they can't integrate their different kinds of, of knowledge. Um, Joseph works together. Joseph is actually the student that, uh, that was quoted before. He works together with Robert, one of the other African students. So they're sitting alone uh, in one corner of the room. Two Eastern European social scientists work together. Inga works alone. John and Luisa sit together, but they talk about something else. Then we have uh, one of the few Danish students in the program that gets up and leaves the room. And as she passes John and Luisa, she says, I was just wondering if they were actually taking it seriously. So what we have here is both um, the fragmentation uh, that we see as uh, in, in the situations where we don't have autonomy, um, but there's also the, the loss of authority because what she's talking about here when she's asking, I was just wondering if they were actually taking it seriously, is that she's talking about whether they really think that uh, the task they have been given is worthwhile to, uh, to work on. So most of, uh, of the students, uh, except uh, the African and uh, a few of the Eastern European students actually refuse to work on the task. They do something completely different. So there's a loss of authority and there's a fragmentation going on among the students, uh, which I find interesting here. Now I am uh, turning to the other program with a few examples again, uh, where I want to talk about the difference both in, in ways of, uh, of interacting, uh, but also differences uh, compared to the, the first program in terms of what kind of knowledge they're producing. Um, this is uh, also an interdisciplinary program, but perhaps not as uh, as, as interdisciplinary as the other one. This is uh, between political science, media studies, and, and journalism. Uh, and it is a highly academic program. It is not a practical program. So it is not 
a program that teaches the students how to, to write a good article. It is a program that uh, teaches them uh, the role of journalism in a globalizing world. Um, and if you see here, if you take a look at the first quote that I have, um, uh, if, we, uh, if we look at, uh, at how the program is uh, legitimizing itself, what kind of identity it has, um, we have a lecturer in, in one of the very first classes who explains to the students, it is not about finding a right answer. It is about thinking about it, engaging with it. I want independent assessment of the concept. Use your background from previous education and your national selves. I want analytical originality, but also consistency. Engage with each other, engage with your network. So here we have a, a very different kind of, of knowledge, a very different kind uh, or a different way of engaging with uh, international students and the knowledge they bring, because here it is actually uh, an encouragement to the students uh, to weaken what we could call the horizontal autonomy of the program. They're encouraged to bring in both um, knowledge with, uh, that is closely linked to the, to the semantic context, but also a more generalizing theory from their previous education. And this is actually something that, uh, that pops up again and again uh, in the data from this program. Um, I'm not going to read all of this, but I'm going to explain uh, what goes on here. It is uh, also from, it's from the observations uh, at the program. And here it is, uh, it is a description of what goes on among students that are working together doing group work. Um, so uh, we're looking at these horizontal relations and we're looking at how they interact with the knowledge of the other and the knowledge from the other's background. They have been asked to discuss our liberal values universal or our uh, liberal values Western. And what they're doing here is that they, they're using uh, Fukuyama uh, and uh, it is clear that they, they give each other time to, to make their points clear because some of them do struggle a little bit with language. Um, and they have one who seems to be the expert on Fukuyama. But you can see here in the, in the discussion below how um, even though they have one who seems to be an expert on, on Fukuyama, is allowing the others to, uh, to make both theoretical points, but also to draw upon uh, their actual contextual experiences. And they're using it in their discussion and also in the later presentation that they do in class to assess um, and to further develop uh, their own theoretical positions. Um, and what I also think is interesting here is that uh, in contrast to, to the conflict that we saw at, uh, at the other program, uh, even though that there's a lot of, of disagreement and they have lots of different backgrounds, uh, the horizontal relations between the students are characterized by a sense of cohesion. And they recognize that they need each other's uh, both theoretical knowledge, but also uh, each other's uh, contextual knowledge in order to develop their theoretical points of view and in order to develop their knowledge. Um, and uh, this is a quote from an interview. Uh, a student says that, uh, I do not try to convince people. We're just here uh, or there to share our views and to, um, from this kind of discussion, we can have a more comprehensive or more subjective view of the world. Another student says that, um, like I have a way, a broader thinking and an approach to issues that I would um, have done still working in East Africa like the issues that I was writing about in East Africa. Here I can see them at a broader perspective and not just what's happening to these people, uh, but how it affects everyone across the globe. So it is not just about a, a local context and how a certain issue um, is experienced in a local context, but it is something that connects them. Uh, they use it to develop a way of thinking that connects them. Um, I think first it is because the program is international, then of the program, because the program gets much from the diversity. And then she continues talking about how they, they use each other's knowledge to, to develop a, a more a comprehensive position or a more nuanced way of thinking about the world. Um, and here they're using it again. Uh, they're talking about uh, 
this is a quote from uh, from the uh, from the interviews, um, and again it it shows something about how uh, the students experience that the lecturers use their knowledge to uh, to develop some some sort of cohesive knowledge building. They manage to include the global uh, because they give us room. They always give us room to relate to our own experiences. Um, so that is the actual experiences and where we are coming from. And we are allowed to push them in our discussions and presentations. So in that way, I think they manage to include globalization. And what is clear in, uh, in the observations from uh, the classes in, in this program is that um, they're using their um, experiences to challenge the theoretical positions of the lecturers. Um, and it is done in a way where they, they can engage in an actual discussion and without the international students becoming empirical examples of, uh, of something that they have seen in the theory. Um, this is a quote that says much uh, something similar. Uh, international education can broaden and deepen my views of the world and my views and sensibility towards my life. What shall I do to live a happy life and how should I treat the world? How should I view the world? I think this is the main purpose. Because if you study abroad, you have a wider thinking and you don't just think about what affects you. You think about what affects everyone and how everyone does stuff, stuff in the cultures of every place. That's why I chose studying abroad. And I think it's interesting to see that we have these very different evaluations of the programs depending upon whether um, they have autonomy in the hierarchical dimension or not, or direction. Um, so in summary, uh, what I'm thinking about um, and uh, the kind of relationships that are, that are in the programs that I have data from is that uh, in these, uh, or in this data uh, at the programs that I know something about, uh, relational autonomy or weak relational autonomy in the hierarchical di direction does not display any real engagement with knowledge from other fields. And this is where we see the international student uh, as someone who is only included as representative of knowledge that is tied to, uh, to the context of its production or to the student's local context from home. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the programs that do display this um, autonomy in this, uh, in this direction, uh, there's another or a different kind of ability to engage with the student's theoretical knowledge. Uh, there's another sense of, uh, of being recognized and being included as an autonomous theoretical thinker um, that is uh, seen in both in, in the interactions uh, in class, but also in, uh, in the interviews with, uh, with the students. And of course, then the question is, is this a causal relationship? Um, and since I only have the uh, data from three programs, it's difficult to say, but I do think that there's something in uh, this notion of autonomy that uh, that actually can say quite a lot or it can help us a lot in terms of researching both how we establish authority um, but also how our uh, autonomy or heteronomy allows us to engage with knowledge of other people uh, in many or in very different ways uh, so I do believe that um, if we're speaking from an autonomous position, it also means that we have the flexibility to actually open up that autonomy, um, to open it up towards other kinds of knowledge and to, uh, to include it in our, in our theory building and in the knowledge that is presented in a particular situation. So I think this is something that is uh, quite interesting to, to look into. And I also think it's interesting to see how it connects to um, these different ways of thinking about the international student either uh, as someone who provides uh, contextual, local contextual knowledge or as someone who um, equal to the Danish or the, the local students in Denmark have the capability of being an, an autonomous and theoretical thinker um, basing his or her knowledge upon their uh, contextual knowledge. Yes, I think that is uh, what I wanted to, to share with you today. Uh, so thank you very much for, for listening. Um, of course, if you have questions, you, you're very welcome. Stop sharing.
Yeah, thank you for the comments. Are you guys taking questions for all three presentations now, or how? what are you doing? Yes, I th think we should take questions uh, from all three presentations. Maybe while people get their thoughts together, I can just add that um, one of the fantastic things about our Nordic network is, is the way that, you know, when, when we meet, then somebody gives one presentation and then somebody else says, oh, that sounds really interesting. That's a, I wonder if I could use that and then sort of feeds into each other. And we've been so privileged and happy to be able to do that. And I think um, the presentation that the three of you guys had after, after our first one really shows as well how how a lot of the work that we're doing without even having known each other ahead of time really speaks well to each other and, and how, how um, happy we are to be able to have sort of the same language to, to talk to our different areas about um, through LCT. It has definitely been uh, very interesting and very fruitful for me um, to, to meet uh, the people in the Nordic network because, uh, well, since I came across uh, this framework uh, by coincidence, uh, it's not something that is actually practiced uh, in my research group or among people that I know from uh, from my home university. So it's uh, it's very nice to have to have people that uh, that can give you new new ideas and uh, and feedback. Well, can, can I ask you a question, then, Tanya? Nobody else has their hands up um, <laughs> yet. <laughs> Um, but I wonder, is this some, so do you uh, present the LCT analyses that you've made to your group and, and what do they say when you do? <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? Um, I think, uh, first of all, um, some of them are struggling a little bit. <laughs> I can, I th I'm pretty, I'm sure that they can see that it is highly relevant and it is actually, it's very much, um, it, it, it turned out to be a lot of what I needed in order to actually analyze how knowledge shape the way we interact. So it's not just a matter of some sort of social recognition, um, or it's not just a matter of who has status in the, in the global field, and that influences it as well. Of course, uh, I think that's what, what I can see in my data, that it does matter where you come from. You do have status depending on where you come from. But it's also quite clear to me that depending on what kind of knowledge we practice in the classroom, it very much shapes the way people interact. And it's, it's very, very powerful in terms of deciding in which way people uh, potentially become included. Mm. And I think that my group can see that as well. <laughs> That's excellent. I'm just being quiet to see if anyone else wants to jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Martina has a hand up. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> yes, thank you, Tanya and all the others for wonderful presentations. Uh, I was thinking about Tanya's, uh, uh, listening to Tanya's examples. I was more, uh, I was trying to identify what kind of ideal knowers these two programs present or put forward? And I was thinking, and that led me to the specialization plane. Have you considered using this yes, dimension? I have. Yes, I have used yeah. that. Uh, but I just decided today to, uh, to focus uh, or to try to start thinking about semantics. Um, because uh, what I have seen in the data is that that people are included or excluded also based on specialization codes, simply um, whether the other students recognize the kind of, of codes that the students uh, from other contexts uh, present or draw upon, but it's also something that influences uh, the authority of the lecturers. So if, if, um, if the lecturers are using other kinds of specialization codes than what the students are used to, then they might not recognize them as authorities. Uh, so there's this, uh, the, the problem of, uh, of recognizing the different kinds of codes. Um, and uh, there's also, I think, something interesting to look into 
in terms of ways of uh, of engaging, for instance, with um, a social gaze. Um, and I've done that. I've looked into that in the same data uh, that I've been talking about today, um, because uh, they're actually at both programs drawing upon or seeing the international students as, as students that to some extent uh, represent the social gaze. Um, but at the first program that I talked about, they're treating that gaze um, through training. So they're training uh, the students, the international students, to become uh, the same kind of knowers that the, that the program represents. Whereas I think if we, uh, if we look at uh, the last program that I talked about, I think it, it could be described more as a cultivation. I don't know if that was what you were thinking about. Um, yeah, it was. I, I wasn't. Um, I haven't gone uh, that far into the analysis. I was just thinking of a, a nice contrast between one ideal kind of knower that's mo more focused on a holistic concept of education, bildum yeah. thinking, yes. and the other one where uh, knowledge is uh, more not normative or, or i don't know how to say it but it's it's uh, less uh, problematized yes so. yeah yeah thank you yes you're welcome thank you for the question i can't see i don't know if i'm uh, taking questions or if i'm keeping track of uh, potential questions but i can't see all of you uh, so if you have questions for for either me or the other two presenters just uh, Unmute and uh, and let us know. Hi, it's Billy here. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, yeah, I was really interested in the way, as I say, um, what you might call um, local and international students are uh, are characterized, and it's not quite the same thing. But uh, when we talk in South Africa, we often talk about the way um, indigenous African students and students from other groups are um, conceptualized. I mean, very often like in terms of their English yeah. and their English proficiency. And it's the, but so often the, the indigenous African students are put into this category called problem and then they're sent away somewhere to be fixed. Yes. Uh, you know, they fix so that they can come and join the group as, perhaps, you know, is exactly as Martina said, this kind of idealized knowers or ideal knowers. Yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, does such an ideal knower even exist, you know? But anyway, um, yeah. So that was just, a, I mean, it's just an interesting comment and parallel. Yes, and and I think when we when we developed our our project uh, at at Aarhus University, we were of course also interested uh, in seeing how these uh, issues of language play in because uh, English is not uh, the native uh, language in Denmark, but we have quite a lot of programs that are taught in English. Uh, but we are not native speakers and and how might that uh, influence the status that the danish students have and the status that the um that the uh, international or that the that the lecturers have it belongs to one of the other projects in the, in our group but it's it's uh, definitely something that is interesting i also think it's it's interesting to turn it around and actually look at uh, when we look at um, at inclusion in international education. I think it's interesting and I think it's very fruitful to turn away from notions of language and culture and look at what kind of knowledge and how uh, it is legitimated and how that influences whether people are included or feel acknowledged or not. This is so great. You have another question from Risa. Okay, sorry, I didn't see it. No, nope, that's okay. <laughs> uh, let's see, uh, yeah, I can see here it's in, it's in the chat. Um, do you think that disciplines that have horizontal knowledge structures may have a tendency to emphasize uh, relational autonomy? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, yes, it's I, I, 
can't think through my data fast enough to, to answer your question, but I, th I think it might be a tendency that I can see um, in my data um, that, that there's a stronger emphasis. But on the other hand, um, one of the problems with, with my data set is that I don't have data from a program that is pure science. Um, and uh, there might be something here um, because that, that might, or it's highly likely also that the, the programs in, in, in pure science um, would display or emphasize relational autonomy in uh, the hierarchical direction that I talked about. Um, uh, but I don't have data. <laughs> but I, I think that, the, that there is something there that, that, that could be very interesting to look at. Uh, also in terms of how uh, you uh, integrate or interact with the knowledge of the international students in, uh, in, a, in, a, in that kind of program. I don't know if this is some a bit of, of, of an answer to that question maybe, but we studied um, um, uh, groups of, of uh, teachers in, in history and mathematics that is uh, more of an um, horizontal and an hierarchical, uh, horizontal and hierarchical uh, subjects. And in mathematics, there were much more of a trained gaze and in history, there was much more of a cultivated gaze. Yes. I also remember that uh, that I went to uh, to a research day um, very far away in the countryside here in Denmark, and I was alone without my group. And I met um, a research director from uh, chemistry, and he was there to write a research proposal. But it was clear that he talked about uh, how to include international students in very different terms than uh, than than what you see in these programs. Uh, so I I do think it would be interesting to have another kind of data or data from another type of program in order to look into this in more detail uh, in relation to this question from, from Rita um, about whether uh, there's a difference here between uh, horizontal knowledge structures and how, uh, how we might emphasize uh, relational autonomy. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, if people are in need of a break by now or <laughs> uh, where we are at this stage. I'm guessing there's a new session starting very soon. But I definitely yes. want to yeah. the, the next the next session will be starting at at, at two o'clock. Um, so perhaps there'll be a, a kind of a, just a filler if, if, if you guys are done, but otherwise feel free to carry on chatting. I had a quick comment, Tanya. Yeah. I mean, the other, um, piece of data that's, uh, you kind of went at in passing was the way the your re European students were, they talked about your European students being seen as authorities on Africa. Yeah. But, the, yeah, but there was no way that an African student would, or, or an, that an African student couldn't reciprocally be a, um, a, an expert on Europe somehow. Yeah. The, yeah, or, or even bring their European knowledge. Yeah. The quote was, was from, from an African student. Uh, yeah. so it was an African student talking about he uh, well he had learned quite a lot of uh, of European history, quite a lot of of he had a lot of knowledge about Europe before he actually came to to Denmark. Uh, but uh, he was he in his experience he wasn't uh, recognized as an authority on uh, European knowledge or. Uh, on uh, uh, European history or European conditions in the same way as, uh, as a European student could claim um, authority over knowledge about Africa. 
So that was his experience. And I think it makes sense when, when I look at the way his knowledge is treated um, at the program that he's participating in. This is a very, very, very intelligent, very bright student who's really struggling. Uh, and he is actually doing quite well. He also talks about earlier on in the interview how he needed to learn how to, to study in Denmark, but he, he learned it quite quickly. Um, but he's not recognized uh, in, his, uh, in his groups uh, when he's working uh, together with other students. They're actually assigning him the role of a secretary that can uh, proofread their, their work before they hand it in. Um, and uh, he's also struggling to, uh, to get a PhD. Um, and even though he actually has quite good grades um, and uh, quite a good project, he is not uh, granted a stipend. Uh, so I think we have uh, the problem on, on, on many different levels that he's only seen as someone who brings uh, contextual knowledge from his home country. And he doesn't really, he isn't allowed to, to develop theory. There's something here um, about international students. Let's see. Yeah, uh, I think um, I think I know what what you are asking about here. Um, we use international, or I use international, uh, because it is the label that we see from uh, the university. Um, the university had a strategy of internationalization, and we had programs that were described as international, and they have, they defined it in many different ways. Um, so when when I'm analyzing it, or what I think is relevant to do is um, to look at both how um, the national context that the, that the students come from is, is brought into play, uh, but definitely the relations between students with very different backgrounds. And I think what is actually most significant in our data is that um, we can't really see dominant groups if we are looking at only nationality. There are no groups that are dominant. Only in one of the programs, there's a strong dominance of Danish students. It's not in the programs that I have been talking about. Otherwise, we need to describe differences in other ways. So what we have done in the survey, or what my colleague has done in the survey, is uh, that she has made um, sort of a, a sociocultural um, biography of the students uh, that describes the students in relation to, uh, to social class and uh, um, mobility capital that she's talking about and strategies that, that students have for participating in what we call international education. So we, we can define uh, groups based on social class and that's also where we have Bourdieu in, in the project. Um, and what I'm doing is that uh, I haven't really, I haven't presented it here today, but I have described um, the students participating in my study based on uh, legitimation codes. So I have used legitimation codes to describe the kind of differences that, uh, that are at play in the programs. So I'm using international because it's the label that we use at the university. I don't know if that answers the question. Actually, Tanya, I, um, I think that's a really good answer because um, uh, when the main issue of social class difference and uh, education expansion bringing in new social classes into education, particularly higher education. Uh, a lot of people just got endlessly involved in a pointless argument about how to define social class. Yeah. And the same thing has happened in all sorts of categories and ends up with this sort of, kind of quasi philosophical debate as to exactly how to define all these categories. And, and it ends up not being able to uh, then talk across different kinds of uh, social differences like class, race, gender, nationality, and so on. And that's one of the things that I've found LCT useful for is to be able to translate all of those sorts of things into things like semantic range or um, you know specialization codes and that sort of thing. Because it's not as simple as this nationality does better than that or... Um, this social class does better than that, you know. Yeah, it's it's very different. Uh, or I think it's it's as you say, it's much more complex, and I think it has an advantage um, 
at least in two ways. One is that we begin to recognize what kind of knowledge people have been exposed to. But I also think you can, you can turn it around and use it as a pedagogical, oh, sorry, pedagogical tool. Um, so it is actually something that can, can uh, explain differences as something which isn't tied to necessarily to class or to, uh, to national background, cultural background. Um, so I think it's something that can be used as a very uh, productive tool for inclusion. But thank you. I think we're out of time. Um, thank you very much for uh, for listening and uh, and for your questions and comments. I look forward to to hearing more from uh, from all of you. <laughs>